Have you ever tried to rebuild what God has already destroyed in your life? Turn your Bibles to Galatians, please. We're only going to be two places. I'm going to want you to be in both. We're going to be in Acts 10. Um, it's important that you see that. And then, and then also Galatians 2 as we finish the chapter. If you're a note taker, um, everything kind of hangs on this question. Have you ever attempted to rebuild in your life what God has already taken the time to destroy? Have you ever taken a step backwards? And so in sanctification, you'll hear the statement many times that um, I am not where I want to be in life, but I'm not where I was. Amen? Like I'm not where I started. I'm further along in the journey, and, and God bless all of that progression towards Christ. It's a journey. But at times, we have actually taken a step backwards, it's not just baby step forward. Have you ever tried to lay sand on rock? When we look at the Sermon on the Mount as Christ himself speaks of building a foundation for my people that are married, think about your godly foundation of your marriage, parenting, your individual walk. If you are a, a youth who is saved and baptized and you're walking towards Jesus, if you're a, a senior adult, no matter who you are, and you have a foundation, you're not losing that but have you ever tried to lay sand in which God talks against on the rock that you've already been given? Have you ever tried to rebuild what God has destroyed? Look at Galatians 2, verse 11 through 21. Now, this is a story of Peter and Paul, and I want you to hang on everything. I want to make sure you understand the moment. Now remember, this is a letter, and, and Paul recounts this moment with Peter. It says, now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. So what we have here is this moment where, where Paul confronts Peter, and he says he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came now, he withdrew and separated himself. He feared those who were of circumcision, being Peter. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before all of them, if you... Being a Jew, live in the manner of the Gentiles and not of the Jews. Why do you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith in Jesus Christ. Even when we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, not by works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Will you highlight 17 through 19 for me? Have your Bibles out. But if we, Paul says, speaking to Peter and speaking to everybody, he said, I did this in front of the whole crew, right? But if we, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners. If Christ, therefore, is a minister of sin, certainly not. Hang on at 18. For if I build again, rebuild, right? If I build again those things in which I destroyed, I myself am a transgressor, for through the law I died to the law that I might live to God. Verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. And the life in which I now live in the flesh, and I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Last verse, hang with me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Have you ever tried to rebuild what God has already destroyed? Have you ever tried to lay sand on rock? Let's take a moment and pray for our time together. God, we thank you for today. As David so rightfully said, we have already been blessed. 
Man, we have so many gifted, phenomenal, wonderful Sunday school teachers. I'm overwhelmed by I see all the classes and all the dedicated individuals. This is not a church who looks for warm bodies. We have a line of men and women who love to pour your good news into children from nursery to our seniors in adult classes. We are blessed and we thank you. We have been blessed by such phenomenal praise and worship music. My heart is so encouraged when I see this stage full. I love seeing all the musicians and all the singers and, and David leading us. Man, I am, I am encouraged when I see this place packed, and I thank you. I thank you for our visitors, and I thank you for our members and our leaders. Lord, I pray that we remove all distractions. Let us set our eyes on your glorious word. Let us leave here not taking steps backwards, but we grow closer to you in our time within the body. Be with us, forgive us of our sins. Let us grow closer to you in today's time. In your name, the church says in harmony, amen. So far in Galatians, if you have not been with us um, or you have just forgotten, the whole point of this book is Paul comes and he writes this letter to people that he has walked with and taught and loved and been on mission with. And what he has done is he has tried to come and attack a distorted gospel. And so when I say distorted, you could say false gospel, and that would be accurate. But in your mind, I want you to think of distortion because from the other perspective, they would not think false. They would have said, we are on the same team. We love the same God. We follow the same Jesus. Your lingo is a little bit different than mine, Paul, but we're all moving the right direction to where Paul would say, no. What you have taught is a distorted gospel, a distorted truth at Jesus Plus. And so for some of you guys, I've been very blessed because I've talked to so many of you this week and last week, and you go, man, that was my childhood. I've had so many conversations, like a dozen, with you calling me. I've had people from different states and countries email going, man, like that is how I live. Like I am the people of Galatia. It is so strange to me. That's why it made the book. I was laughing with one of you guys. I forgot who it was, but, you know, this is a big book, but it's probably hard to get into, right? So something's important about this book, something relatable, something for our good. God knew that we needed the book of Galatians. So Paul looks at these individuals and said, you know the truth. You have bought into a lie. It is not the same. It is a Jesus plus. Believe in God, follow Jesus, and be baptized. Love God and follow Jesus and give 10%. Go to church, teach Sunday school, be a part of VBS, go to New York City and serve. Do all of these things and then you will be right with Christ. It's not that big a deal, Paul. We, we're following the same path to where Paul would say, hey, listen, I see good behavior, but a false truth. Take note of that. I see good behavior. 10% is awesome. Coming to church is awesome. Being baptized is awesome. Going to New York is awesome. Teaching is awesome. It's not going to save you. If that is where your salvation comes from being a good southern boy or girl in life and making good moral decisions, you are going to be an individual of Matthew 7, and you are going to hear, I never knew you. Hell, hang on it, is going to be filled with church folks. And he says, listen, good behavior, good stuff there, but false truth. And so what we read in today's message is the other side of the equation. Man, I see the truth. I see the gospel. Peter knows fully what it means to love and follow Jesus. He knows and he is taught and he had died for the gospel. But what we see here is good and right truth, but a distorted behavior, which is just as confusing. So I want you to understand the moment, if that was too many verses for you to hang on. So what we have is we have Paul and we have Peter. We're looking at the Larry Bird and Magic Johnson of the New Testament. This is the dream team in the moment. They're playing on the same squad. They are together, which didn't happen very often. 
And he says, listen, instead of high five and then throwing alley-oops, I came to my brother Peter and I confronted him awkwardly in front of everybody because I wanted them all to hear. And what did Paul say to Peter? What was the issue? Was it that Peter was teaching a false gospel? Was it that Peter bought into these false teachers and started to distort the gospel with his words? Was that the problem? No. Paul looked at Peter and said, hey, man, your behavior, your actions, your life is not matching your message. Peter understood the gospel, but what he was doing to the Gentiles, and remember week one, what is a Gentile? Not a Jew. And so the Gentiles always had this momentum of, what do I got to be to be a Jew? We knew the Jewish people were God's people, so if you want me to be circumcised, I'll do it. If you want me to give 10%, I'll give 11. I'll be here on Sunday morning and Sunday night. What do I got to do to be in good standings with God, right? That was always the belief. That was always the feeling. That was always what was communicated. And so we had this moment where we know that is not the gospel. God came for all people. Jesus was sent to rescue all. But what we have here in this moment is Peter literally went away from the Gentiles only to the Jews and treated the Gentiles like they had been heard about. He treated them like second-class citizens in Christ. And Paul says that is not the message in which you preach. Your actions are confusing people. I love this. Paul brings to light that our actions, that our behavior can distort the gospel just as easily as our words can. You hear that? Good truth. Good word. Good gospel. Accurate. Spot on. Bullseye. Poor behavior. I want you to remember who Peter was. If you've been a part of this church, starting with footprints three years ago, we took a whole year in Matthew. And then we went on that hill during the pandemic, we did First and Second Peter, some of my favorite time in the nine years I've been here. And what we saw in Peter was Peter loved the Lord and he had a lot of ups and downs. Peter walked with Christ. He was the first one to drop his nets. He was in a party of three at one time. He witnessed the cross. He broke bread after the resurrection with Christ. He went back to fishing, jumped in the water, and then ate breakfast with them, right? Like he had seen some awesome things. He taught the gospel. Hang on it. He taught the gospel. And not only did he teach the gospel, he taught the gospel on this subject to these people concerning these circumstances. Look at Acts 10. Keep your tassel in Galatians because I'm going to quickly go back, okay? But look, I want you to see it, man. This is eye-opening. This is why... I tell you to read the devotion, um, you would have already had this read, already been ready for the words and teaching, okay? Because that, that was on the website. I want you to remember that. But look at Acts 10, starting with verses 34. This is Christ after he has left them. Peter and other are teaching the gospel. Things are in disarray. They are staying faithful. And listen to the moment. This is years before Galatians. Verse 34 in chapter 10. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, in truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, no favoritism. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Who says this? Peter says this. Skip down to verse 44. Now, while Peter was still speaking these words of truth, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard this word. And those of the circumcision who believed, they were astonished. As many as came to Peter because of the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the same of the Lord, name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay for a few days more. Go back to Galatians. 
Peter knew the gospel. Peter understood that God came for all. Peter understood that there were no works that could save or favoritism needed, that a faith in Christ is what saves. He understood that. Fast forward in life, look back at verse 12. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. That's what he would do in the past. But when they came now, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were the circumcision. He didn't fear him in Acts, did he? And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite card with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. What we see is Peter's behavior distorted his message. His actions, his life His behavior did not match his truth. Right truth, distorted behavior. Man, if you are a note taker, this is a powerful question. I don't care how old you are. Has your life ever contradicted the message that you profess to be true? That's a good one. Has your life, has your actions, has your behavior your decisions, have they ever been contrary to the message that you profess to be true? Has your actions ever confused others? Let's take a second. Have your actions ever confused other people? Like you ever gotten on this stage or read scripture or prayed and other people been like one eye open like what is happening? Like, aren't you the guy who was screaming at the the referee $20 a game? Weren't you the guy vulgar? Like, weren't you that guy? And now you're talking praise Jesus, right? Your life ever confused other people? Your life ever distorted an, an awesome truth? Hang on it. Your kids... Your parents, your spouse, your husband, wife, your friends ever hear one thing that you believe, but they see something different? And you say that you love the Lord. You come to church on Sunday. You do the things of the Lord. You say that you love Christ. But man, I look at your behavior and I hear your words and I see how you act. And brother doesn't seem as if you're on the same page. Have you ever laid sand on rock? You ever laid sand on rock? Galatians reminds us how easily, not that we lose our salvation or that we can earn it, But Galatians does such a wonderful job of showing how our sinful nature will drift to one end of the spectrum to the other. We will drift to legalism. Man, I've been doing this a long time. I've been doing this Christianity game for a good minute. I read my Bible. I give my money. I come to church. I stand and I sit when they tell me to. My eyes are closed when he's praying. I'm doing a good job. Check, 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 check. And we will drift. From an intimacy with God to checking boxes. And on the same note, we will drift on the same spectrum to hypocrisy. Man, God saves, grace covers all. Don't put me in a box. Don't put me in a box. I'm free to live the way I want to. Both confuse and hurt the lost and seeking, but also the saved. Do you see this verse here? It says in verse 13, And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas, let me hang on that, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Do you know what we see here? We see stumbling block. Peter was living in such a way, not the lost man, not the drifting man, but a saved, faithful man said, well, hey, if Peter's doing it, I guess it's okay for me to do it. Right? And have you ever hurt someone else's walk? We're not talking about just you. But have you ever made a decision 
put something ahead of God, behaved in such a way where now your life was actually leading people away from Christ? It says even Barnabas followed suit. Because who knows Christ better than Peter? Peter had an awesome testimony. Like, I was numero uno, right? There was nobody on the Jesus team before I dropped my net. And so Barnabas goes, hey, listen, if, if, if Peter withdraws from them, so I guess it's okay if I do. Our life can drift from legalism to hypocrisy very, very quickly. In legalism, do better, check the box, Jesus plus, Matthew 7, I never knew you. Or hypocrisy. And I feel like I hear this garbage all the time. Grace covers all, Hunter. I'm saved by Jesus. There's nothing that I can do to earn or, or deserve or take away. So don't put me in a box. I'm free. I'm free to live the way that I want to. In which I would say, brother, amen, I understand all of those things you're saying. But um, it's not that Jesus might not know you, but you are living in a way that I don't know you know him. All right? Paul says in verse 17, but if we, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. If Christ therefore a minister, if is Christ therefore a minister of sin, certainly not. For if I build again, highlight that, underline it, do what you got to do. For if I build again those things in which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor, for I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. Paul tells the people of Galatia, he tells Peter, and he tells you and I today, do not return to foolishness. Will you write that somewhere on your Bible? Do not return to foolishness. Do not rebuild what God has taken away from you. You have a solid foundation. Why are you carrying around bags of sand? Christ has accomplished what the law could not. Christ has died so you and I could live in freedom and peace. Christ has spurred us on to know and to live the gospel, not distort it by our actions. Do not rebuild debt that's been paid off. I remember when Wendy and I got married, she was like babysitting, and I had like a full-time job making part-time money. I think we got married, and we were making around 18000 a year. And so we were tight. Things were struggling. You know, McDonald's was an anniversary-type moment. And I remember she came into our marriage. She had a credit card, a city card. It was black, and I can tell you the numbers. Like, that thing was etched in my brain, how much I despise this card. And we had that card for a good minute. And like I said, there was about $2,000 on it. And that doesn't seem like a lot of money, but when you're making 18 grand, 2,000 is a lot. That was a bill we didn't need and we didn't have much. So some of you guys know this story that 2,000 kind of turned into 3,000. And that 3,000 turned into 5,000. And then I remember sitting there still making 18 grand going, man, we owe six grand. And like I said, I know six grand, that's not house money. Right? You're not buying a boat with it or a nice one, but if you're making 18000 that's 30-something percent of your annual income before taxes. And so, man, we said, hey, we got to get this off us. You ever felt like that? Like, I can't stand that bill. I see the interest. Like, I feel unwise and ignorant, man. We got to get this thing off of us. I can't move forward because I'm always taking a step back with this card, Right? So man, hey, no Florida, no new car, no new furniture. We won't go out to eat, man. We just attacked this city card, paid it off. Took about a year and a half, six grand, right? Man, it was such freedom. You ever paid a credit card off? Man, we danced for days. But then, you know what? We didn't call and cancel it, all right? And so, you know what? There was like a moment where something happened and... You know, we're like, well, hey, just put it on the credit card. We used to owe six. You know, 60 bucks isn't a big deal. Well, it's just 60 bucks. Let's just put another 200 on it. We need groceries. We need something. We can, if we can pay 6,000 off, we can pay out 500. And then all of a sudden, 
thought we were like back at four grand, right? And I remember just looking at my life and looking at the situation and going, man, I paid off this frustrating, destructive debt just to regain it. I paid it off just to regain it. Legalism and hypocrisy is debt regained. Do you hear me? Christ did not die for your boxes to check. It doesn't matter. There's not enough boxes for you to check to regain favor in him. Christ did not die for you to live in a manner and way that is confusing and distorting the good news of who Jesus is. Your hypocrisy and lifestyle and behavior that contradicts the goodness of who Jesus is is debt that has already been paid off that you have just lived a lifetime regaining. Have you ever, have you ever attempted to rebuild what God has destroyed in your life? I want you to look back at verse 20. This is a great word right here. Look at verse 20. I almost have all of our text this week highlighted. And when, when, I, when I pass away, and this is, um, this is Lila's Bible. This is the one that I'm going to give Lila. Man, I want this to be a rainbow. I want you to see no white parts of this whole book. Look at verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. Will you highlight that with me? I have been crucified with Christ. It is not, it is no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. And the life which is now that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I have been crucified with Christ. You know, this word crucified, I think, is very intentional. Um, there's a reason that it did not say death or decapitated or put down. When you look at the word crucifixion or crucified, um, that is a symbol of something very specific concerning biblical times. So most people that would be crucified, that was a very slow and torturous death. Uh, it's hard to think of a way to die that would be worse than crucifixion. So most people who would be crucified, what they would do is they would, they would hang nails in your palms and they would hang you there and, and they would most of the time either put nails in your feet or they would just leave you dangling, okay, dangling. And so when you look at this, most people would die from either blood loss or starvation or most historians now say the people probably didn't realize it, but dehydration because you'd be out there in the sun and the sun would be hitting you and you would just literally die from lack of water, and people back then, in most areas, they would line the streets with crosses. And people had the right, kids could pick up rocks and throw them at people, spit and curse, and even people could walk by. I was reading stories where you could take out a knife and you could just slit a guy's ankles, slit his stomach. You had the right to do those things. So a crucifixion was not like a beheading that was quick. You would sit there on a cross three or four or five days. Most people that went and conducted crucifixions, they wanted it to be torturous. They wanted it to be slow. So if you look back at pictures, you would see where the feet are, um, there'd be these peg holes. And what they would do is I'd be hanging on this cross and I'd be dying out very quickly and someone would come in and they would put this little step to where I could put my feet there and rest for a second and regain some air. I could regain some strength just for them to take the peg out again for me to hang. But man, when you're dying, you'll do anything for a breath of fresh air, right? And so the mind goes into, thank God for the peg, because if not for the peg, I would die now. But what the person was actually doing, they were trying to prolong the death, right? Paul says that my former self has been crucified, put to death, a slow and hard death. For those who have been saved, born again, made new, our past has died on that cross. We are new creatures, new creations. But there are still times where that peg gets put in on that cross, where our past life has died. We are new men, new women, new marriages, new parents, new creations. 
And the enemy will put that peg and we will rest our feet and we will say, praise God. And our past life will get a breath of fresh air. And the old hunter and the old Chris and the old Sue and the old Jacob will come back to life. Hypocrisy is that breath. Hypocrisy is that breath. You ever had a moment in your walk where you go, man, I don't look like the new me. I look like the old me. You ever had that moment? Does it hurt your stomach? I hope it does. It's a good sign. You ever had a moment where you speak in such a way or you say such a thing or you parent in a way or you behave in a way? You're like, man, I'm behaving as a lost man. This is the old David. This is the old Wendy. You know, your past life wasn't beheaded. It was crucified. And you were a new creation. And you were moving in a good direction. But there are times that old life takes a breath of fresh air. That's hypocrisy. That's legalism. I want you to see it as we read Acts and we read Galatians. Peter was the first to follow. He saw the miracles, he witnessed the cross, but he was also the one who abandoned Christ when Christ needed him three times when asked if he knew him. Peter was forgiven and broke bread with Christ after the resurrection. I told you guys, Peter knew the gospel. He preached the gospel. In Acts, he was imprisoned for the gospel. He would later in his life die for the gospel. Galatians 2. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself. Why? Fearing those who were of the circumcision. He gave his life. Hang me and my bride upside down, remember? He got thrown into prison. He went through persecution. He separated himself from these second class citizens. Why? Because he was still the Peter of Matthew who said, I don't know that man. Have you ever laid sand on rock? Have you ever laid sand on rock? Have you ever tried to rebuild what God has destroyed in your life? Have you ever seen your old self show himself? Ever. In verse 21, as we start to close in, Paul tells us the good news. He says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, and in this case also hypocrisy, then Christ died in vain. See, our sinful heart will never reach perfection until we meet him in glory. The sinful heart will naturally lean towards legalism and hypocrisy, which the true gospel is void of. Paul pleads for God's grace and he pleads for the people not to regain the debt that had been paid off. Because like Peter, we will always try to grab air. We will always dangle our toes for the peg and the resting place to get air from the place in which we hang. And Paul knows that grace is the only thing that covers those attempts. As we pray here this morning... Understand that Jesus Christ is enough. If you find yourself the way you were raised and what you were taught and what your mom and dad believed and what you've always told your children, you have leaned towards checked boxes. And you have leaned towards those false teachers who goes, listen, yes, God, yes, Jesus, but make sure you do these things to be enough. God, forgive me, set me free of those boxes, crush them. But also, if right now in your life, if your life, if your actions distort and confuse the truth, God, forgive me. Forgive me. I want you to hang on my words here, okay? Sermon's over. Just listen. There's a lot of aspects to your life. How you use your money and how you speak to your wife and how you love your kids and how you treat your church and how you speak behind closed doors and deer stands. And there's a lot of aspects of your day-to-day. And if there's a part of your life where you go, you know what? I say that I love Jesus, but my actions do not show it. 
If anything, they distort it. And if anything, they confuse other people. Like my kids see me here singing, but then they hear my words on Tuesday and it's very confusing. People around me see what I put first and it is not Christ and I'm luring people away. Like if that is you, God forgive me. Give me a broom to sweep this sand off. Get this sand off. And then lastly, if you are not saved, if you go, Hunter, I'm not putting sand on rock, brother. I'm putting sand on sand. I don't know Jesus. I don't know God. I've been told a lot of things, and this is not the Jesus that I know. Someone two weeks ago looked at me in the face and said, Hunter, the Jesus that you're speaking about, verbatim, the Jesus that you're speaking about in Galatians is not the Jesus that I know, verbatim. Been in church for a long time. That's not the Jesus I know. If this is not the Jesus you know, the one that is enough, the one that we cannot earn or deserve any of his grace and mercy, which is desperately needed, and he came to cover us so that one day we can be in glory with him. If that's not the Jesus you know that needs no additions, that needs no additions, then I pray, God, save me. Save me, save me, save me. Let's bow our heads. God, we thank you for today. Lord, I so thoroughly needed today's word. Your word is always sufficient and always good, but just personally, I just, I was overwhelmed by today's story. Thank you for, um, just personally, thank you for your text. Lord, I believe that in the 10 or 11 verses that we read today, I think it applies to everyone here. I believe that every single, 100% of the people that sit here today, it applies to. It's not always the case. We're in different seasons of life and different circumstances, but I would say that 100%, some are lost here and don't know you. People of Matthew 7, there are people here that have been brought up like, yes, I love God and I got no issue with Jesus, but they just check boxes. And their salvation is going to come from being pretty good, pretty decent, doing a lot of things. And they're going to hear, I never knew you, Lord. They, they, they drift to legalism. Well, there's some people here that they have a foundation, but you wouldn't know it because it's covered in sand. They've gone back to pouring sand. And their words and their actions and their lifestyle, they confuse people. And they don't see the gospel. They hear the gospel, but they don't see the gospel. Lord, I have failed at this in a lot of ways. Man, I stand in front of the line. God, I pray that you forgive us. Man, let our words speak truth. And let our lives show truth. Let them go hand in hand. Let us not confuse. Let us not hurt. Let us not distort. Thank you for your cross. Lord, I thank you personally that that you didn't need a breath of fresh air. That you came perfect and you left perfect. And I thank you for that. I'm not. But Lord, I pray that I kick the peg away. I die to my old self and live and preach the truth. In your precious name, the church says, amen.